I was part of a hit group, that's like a group of assassins. One assignment was to go to the Philippines, not just to take out one guy, but to track his activities too. We put surveillance on his office, on his apartment, on his lover's apartment and so on. If I was ordered to go and throw a grenade back in the day, I think I'd be happy to do it. I adored those kind of guys. And I was ready to do time in prison. 15 years, 20 years. I didn't care. An assassin, a killer. It sounded so impressive, but in reality we were just cannon fodder, expendables. We're on our way to meet a man called Watanabe-san. He built a criminal career spanning over 20 years, rising from a low-level thug to a gang leader. The closer we get to our rendezvous point, the less of what we see around us looks like the Japan we think we know. The most technologically advanced nation with a space exploration program and the world's fastest experimental magnetic levitation trains capable of traveling up to 370 miles per hour. A country that has developed robots to assist the elderly and to work on radioactively contaminated sites. Japanese corporations are among the leaders on the global scene. We all know that Japanese cars, watches, cameras and musical instruments are of top quality. Japan is a leader in terms of life expectancy that exceeds 84 years. It's the third largest economy in the world by nominal GDP, even though the country has next to no mineral resources and a tiny territory. And just 30% of it is habitable. So how come this advanced nation is also home to some very serious organized crime? Leaving the ultra-modern neon-lit streets behind us, we're entering eastern Tokyo and getting close to an area called Sanya. This cheap housing district has the fame of the city's slums, but the truth is that it used to give shelter to day labourers who came to the city to claim menial jobs and were paid by the hour. We're now in the Kabukicho district, in an otherwise extremely law-abiding country. This district is considered amongst the most seedy that you can find. Not only does it harbour abundant criminal activity, it's also a home to many Yakuza gangs, Japan's organised crime syndicates. What makes Japan so special? It makes you feel like you're in a super cool sci-fi movie, and when you realise it's for real, you feel like this reality is sort of more evolved than the rest of the world. But it also gives you the hope that you can catch up. Dear friends, subscribe to me on Patreon. Only on Patreon you'll be able to access my videos that are not available anywhere else. Very soon I'm going to start streaming live for you on Patreon, and all of my new reports will be coming out on Patreon ahead of YouTube. If you wish to make a donation to support my team, you can do so by PayPal. Please find the links in description. I had my body tattooed two times in my life. I got my first tattoos when I was about 21 or 22. Do they mean anything? Here I've got carps. Here is an Asura, a demon. Carps or koi bring good luck. This is Kintaro, a mythical samurai wrestling with a giant carp. It also signifies good luck and a successful career. Known to swim against the current, koi symbolize the ability to overcome obstacles. A carp can go up the waterfall. So if you want to keep moving upward and forward, it's like a dare. You get a tattoo like that. Wait, did you notice Watanabe-san is missing two phalanges on his left hand's little finger? My first thought was that it was probably due to some initiation ritual, like when you join the Yakuza. But no, it has to do with their ritual punishment. The removal of digits, starting with the little finger and moving up the hand to the index finger progressively, has been practiced by the Yakuza members for centuries, because it weakens a person's grip on a sword or katana. See for yourself. I'll pick up this katana first with all of my fingers and then I'll try to hold it with only four. It's definitely much harder. Let's see how it feels with three digits. Wow, it's hard. When I'm holding it with three digits, I get a feeling I can't do shit with it at all. See the difference when I try to wield it with a full hand and with just three digits. Ah, it kind of hurts too. Tough shit. The idea between this type of punishment is that a person with a weak sword grip has to rely more on the group for protection and will be less likely to break the rules and pursue individual projects. Obviously, hardly anyone resolves issues with swords these days, although the truth is that holding a gun with just three digits is also very hard. 
But overall, when Yakuza members sever their fingers these days, it's a tough guy gesture. And by the way, back in the old days, one had to cut off one's own digits themselves. And how do you go about cutting off your little finger? You do it yourself? You can do it yourself, or you can ask someone to help. You stop the blood flow with a rubber band. If you want to cut it off yourself, you can use a big kitchen knife and step on it with your foot. Or you can use a carpenter's flat chisel, putting it with its sharp edge down and driving it in with a hammer. It works better if someone helps you. So you don't use a dagger? A dagger? You probably mean a short sword, or one that you can wear under a shirt. No, it won't do. Severing the sinews isn't easy. A chisel would do the job much better. Watanabe-san cut off his phalanges himself. First, for some major screw-up, and the second time for trying to leave the clan, and then returning. In order to meet him, we had to go to one of Tokyo's most crime-ridden areas. His former Yakuza associates still come to visit him every once in a while, and they don't only come to say hello. Although I am thus disclosing my criminal past, I believe it is necessary. I was aware that I was disclosing my whereabouts this way, and that the criminal world might want to find me for some payback. Much as I expected, I did get threats from the organization I used to be a member of. I did have concerns about talking about my past, but today more and more people disclose their past through video posts. I received threats telling me to keep my mouth shut. People came to threaten me, those who are still in the underworld. Because of the new coronavirus infection, Japan has put a stop on visas to foreign nationals. It's been in effect for several months now. So in order to interview Watanabe-san, the People Project has dispatched its Japan correspondent Genghis and a cameraman to work on site. We're going to an area that's located a bit to the north of the famous Sanya district. So, what is Sanya? There are three areas in Japan that have the uh, fame of being the most crime-ridden ones. Arinchiku, Slams in Osaka, and Tokyo's red light districts, present-day Kabukicho, and historical Yoshiwara. Back in the old days, these were cheap lodging areas, where day labourers could spend a night for pennies between jobs. Day labourers were people who didn't have or want to have permanent employment, so couldn't be employed, like ex-Yakuza members who were outcasts of the society and had no other choice but to live in a shady neighbourhood. Some people had too many debts and were hiding from creditors there. There were lots of reasons which overall made this area quite seedy and crime-ridden. It borders Yoshiwara, which is Tokyo's famous red light district. This is a Dachi ward in Tokyo. You can see some old ladies selling goodies in the metro exit. Here you can get bananas, two pounds for 190 Japanese yen. That's about a dollar and a half. Here they sell homemade preserves in glass jars. That's what the slums look like here. You can spot people drying their laundry on the balconies and lots of electric wires that aren't in perfect order. I want to emphasize once again, it's the slums in terms of the otherwise very high standards of living in Japan. For example, the police strongly recommends to use two or more locks on your bicycle here. Because if you use only one, it will be stolen. It's nothing like Venezuela, I'd say. The area looks absolutely neat and tidy, pretty safe and even nice. You can, however, notice some details that speak to a lower status of this hood. You can see that common folk live here, like this old man with a shopping trolley. Lots of elderly people here, lots of tiny shops like these. You won't see them in the areas frequented by tourists like Ginza or Shibuya. This doesn't look like a place for tourists indeed. Look at these cheap hotels. You'll often find that um, these cheap lodging advertise themselves in a way that's unexpected for the otherwise very advanced Japan. They say we've got colour TV or air conditioning available. Everywhere else in Japan, such things are a must, and it's a huge setback for a hotel not to have them. But here it's a sign of a better deal. A few more steps and we finally meet Watanabe-san, a former Yakuza boss. This is uh, Watanabe-san. He's uh, very kindly agreed to give us an interview today. Uh, well, shall we? This is a house that has both living quarters and a Buddhist temple inside. Wow, these stairs are steep. I can smell the incense already.
Слово якудза означает комбинацию. The name yakuza originates from the traditional Japanese card game, similar to blackjack, where the worst possible hand that can be drawn is 893, pronounced yakuza in Japanese. That adds up to zero points, so the word refers to people who have nothing to lose, those who hit rock bottom. Another thing to know is that Yakuza is the name of all criminal gangs in Japan rather than any particular one. There are over a dozen Yakuza clans in the country, and I'll mention the top three of them. The first and most powerful Yakuza organization is called the Yamaguchi Gumi. It's considered to be the biggest transnational criminal syndicate. According to Japan's National Police Agency, as of 2020, the Yamaguchi Gumi counted 4,000 members. But that's official statistics, while in reality, there are much more. The organization's turnover is on par with transnational corporations. The Yamaguchi Gumi bring in billions of dollars a year from extortion, gambling, the sex industry, construction kickback schemes and arms trafficking. The organization's headquarters are located in Kobe, the country's major port on the island of Honshu. Check out this guy. He's the organization's supreme kingpin, or Kumicho. His name is Kenichi Shinoda, and he pulls off this bad guy look like in the movies. By the way, the correct way to call him would not be to say boss, but the chairman of the Yamaguchi Gumi. In 2005, Shinoda took control of the 40,000 strong gang and established branches in 18 prefectures, including expansion into the Kanto region, traditionally not Yamaguchi territory. Shinoda likes to maintain an image of a man of the people. For example, after his appointment as Kumicho, he insisted on taking the train to his induction ceremony instead of a chauffeured limousine. People also say that he stopped at a street ramen noodle stall on the way to a lavish banquet in his honor. The second largest Yakuza family is called the Sumiyoshi Kai. It is based primarily in Tokyo and counts, officially, 2,600 members, but that's just an official number. Their territories mainly consist of upscale districts such as Kabukicho and Ginza, and they make money by collecting fees from the shops operating in these territories as part of a good old protection racket scheme, or extortion. The Sumiyoshi Kai differs from its principal rival, the Yamaguchi Gumi, in that it is a confederation of smaller gangs. Its chain of command is more relaxed, and the leadership is distributed among several bosses. The third largest Yakuza family in Japan is the Inagawa Kai, based in Kanto. It's been confirmed to have roughly 2,000 members. Back in the 1980s, the clan's assets were assessed at 1.5 billion US dollars. The organization became quite famous after shipping loads of humanitarian aid to the areas affected by the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. They are pretty much in the same line of business. Drug trafficking, racketeering, the sex industry, extortion is one of the most profitable businesses, by the way. And it so happened that my interviewee today, Watanabe-san, who used to be a member of the first clan I mentioned, the Yamaguchi Gumi, was practicing extortion for some time. But I'm pretty sure you'd never even guess what he had to do to achieve his goal. We wanted to extort a construction company run by some ex-Yakuza who employed illegal schemes. I came with an assistant. We bought two buckets full of feces, well, basically full of shit. Stuck a chicken into one and let it run loose. And then throw it all around. We also threw in some fireworks to imitate dynamite. That was obviously our intimidation tactic. They couldn't keep working with all the interruptions. I feel ashamed now of what I used to do. I was sent to juvenile prison for the things I did. Watanabe grew up in a low-income family. They had a tiny apartment that consisted of a four and a half tatami room. That's right, the living quarters in Japan are measured in tatami. 4.5 tatami roughly equals 80 square feet. Then they moved into a small house. Mother worked from home making some papier-mâché dolls and father drove a cab. They never had much money. My father drove a cab, but he also tried to make more money by collecting recyclables and trading them in for cash. We were broke pretty much of the time. He worked a lot and drank a lot, and he used to get violent when drunk. He beat mom, chased her with a kitchen knife, and she ran from him. These are my childhood memories. He was hard working, but also a drunk who tormented my mother. He could knock over a table with the food she had cooked. He pulled her by the hair, I still remember those violent scenes vividly. Father came from a small, poor village. He had many brothers and sisters, and in places like that, the tradition was to let the eldest son stay with the parents and to kick everybody else out to take care of themselves. I think he felt abandoned because of that. And life was hard, so he took it all out on my mother. I came to realize this many years later, but back when I was a kid, 
I hated my father for drinking. Alcohol gave him these scary eyes. I thought that I would never drink in my life and never become anything like my father. Naturally, I wanted to become an adult as soon as possible in order to leave home and my dad behind. This is what Watanabe's childhood district looks like these days. Not exactly upscale, of course, but absolutely clean, neat and comfy. When the boy was in the sixth grade, his father's employer went bankrupt and the family had to move from Tokyo to the Ibaraki prefecture, basically from a city to a village. I was pretty good at judo and had some success. I won some competitions. I gradually went rogue during the first two years of my junior high school. I hung out with the bad boys because I was a good fighter. I tried smoking. I got into fights all the time. I became a leader of a juvenile gang and we beat those who were weaker. I was going down the criminal path, so basically I entered the Yakuza or Mafia world back when I was in the high school and then I ran away from home. These days, Japan has a law protecting children and youth and facilitating their development so that engaging any underage individuals, that is until the age of 20, in criminal activities is prohibited. It's against the law. But back in the old days, it occurred pretty often that young people joined gangs right out of high school. He started by engaging in school fights between classes. At school, fights were a way for the bad boys to find out who's who and who's the toughest. For example, there were fights in the Bozozoku. Bozozuku are basically biker gangs, the Japanese version of outlaw motorcycle clubs. My headbutts were pretty good. I broke lots of noses. Was there blood? Back in those days, it was cool to come to school or a prom or some other school event as a gang with wooden swords or clubs and to smash windows, harass teachers. When I was in high school, I was usually the one to stop such attacks, acting as a mediator. I negotiated ceasefire between the gangs. As for the drugs, back then kids used to sniff glue with bags on their heads to get high. Real drugs were way too expensive, so kids got high on things like toluene. But seeing them in that shitty state disgusted me. I couldn't stand them. I beat the hell out of them. They drove me nuts when I saw them staggering and weak. In Japan, six years of primary education are followed by three years of junior high school. That's mandatory. Once Watanabe completed his schooling, he found a job. He really wanted to work his way out of poverty. I worked the bar at a nightclub. There was jazz music. Patrons were wearing suits and bow ties, and I made drinks for them in a cocktail shaker. The Yakuza were among the regular customers. They drove posh cars like Lincoln's, for example. When a guy like that comes to a restaurant and you're just a boy from out of town, you naturally think that he's so cool. Before I joined the Yakuza, I joined an ultra-right organisation. I think you have such things in Russia too. In Japan, ultra-right people are those overzealous patriots who worship the emperor and shout, give us back our northern territories, outside the Russian embassy and so on. In reality, almost all of such organisations have connections with the Yakuza. They roam the cities in back vans with loudspeakers, and all that is bankrolled by the Mafia. I was a member of the biggest ultra-right organisation that was connected by the Yamaguchi Gumi. Everyone knew they were backed by the Yakuza, and I was a member of that group since I was 15 or until 16 or until I came of age. Although formally it was a political movement, what we did was basically put pressure on companies using those back vans with loudspeakers. That's what Yakuza do. So my path led me to the Yakuza through an ultra-right organisation. I had quite a record before I turned 20 for assault and battery. I beat people. Once, I recall, we were smashed some communist headquarters. That's the kind of thing ultra-right groups do. I got arrested that time too. Watanabe did his first jail time before he came of age, which is 20 years in Japan, for that shit-covered chicken that they let run loose in a construction company's office. He was charged with one count of blackmail back then. He remembers his first jail time pretty well. Such correctional measures are no longer acceptable in Japan today. They made us run all morning till noon, run and jump, and do push-ups and sit-ups. We did 300, 500, all the time, no breaks, until we got sick. For any slight deviation, they threw you into solitary, like in Russia. 
I broke the rules all the time and spent my time in solitary confinement all year round. In summer it was worse than a sauna. I had a small opening in the door for food. I used to stick my head out and get some air. Are you subscribed to our channel? Not yet? The sad thing is that Anton can't go on his next adventure until you do. So pretty please, subscribe now. That's right, go ahead, click subscribe. Well done and thank you. We can continue now. He was of age when he got out of prison and that's when he became a Yakuza member. That communist hating, chicken shit threats loving, ultra right organization had in the meantime joined the most powerful Yakuza clan, the Yamaguchi Gumi, making Watanabe one of its newest members. The initiation ceremony is quite interesting. Just listen. For example, they address the new recruit saying, if your Ayaban tells you that white is black, then it is black. The new member accepts this by drinking from the ceremonial cup and putting it under his shirt. This ceremony formalizes the Oyabun Koban relationship in the organization. Oyabun is the top boss of the entire organization. The Yakuza traditionally have a hierarchy and a well defined chain of command, much like any other traditional Japanese organization. The head of the clan, or Oyabun, who is also called Kumicho, is the leader of the entire syndicate. He is everybody's boss. Directly beneath him are the Psycho Komon. That's a senior advisor and a Sohon Bucho, a headquarters chief. The second in the chain of command is a Wakagashira, boss's deputy. He gets help from the Fuku Honbucho, an assistant. Each of them is in charge of a number of gangs and their status and influence among the peers and indeed overall depends on how much force they're commanding. When a Kumicho dies, one of his subordinates takes his place. It is typical for the Yakuza members to get massive tattoos covering their entire bodies. In Japan it's a big thing and it's really life-changing because it means you'll remain an outcast to all others for the rest of your life. During the Edo period, Period, tattoo punishment was a criminal penalty and tattooed people were banished from society and even their families. The location of the tattoo was determined by the crime. Thieves were tattooed on the arm, murderers on the head, the shape of the tattoo was based on where the crime occurred and could also provide information about the prison and the term a criminal had served. Experts say that with time, around the 18th century, criminals got to be branded rather than tattooed and the mark was placed on visible parts such as a face or their arms, to make sure others could see it easily. That ensured that such people were excluded from society. So some experts suppose that Yakuza members could have been concealing their marks by covering them with massive tattoos. Another theory is that bodysuit type tattoo has been seen as a sign of membership in a particular group or clan. Another thing new Yakuza members got was a new name. Instead of regular names, they would get something more poetic or heroic. For example, the tiger or the crane. I could be Anton the Crane, for instance. Sounds cool. There was a name that was once popular. Nine Dragons. The Roaring Storm. Liado, the Roaring Storm. I'll be damned, it sounds pretty cool. Anyway, today, full bodysuit tattoos are part of their organization's identities, while hands, face and neck are usually not tattooed. Japanese bodysuits often include tattooing on the genitalia. That's right, some of these guys have tattooed penises. In cases where tattoos cover most of the skin, it can interfere with how a person's skin sweats and create serious problems getting rid of toxins affecting the liver. They always reserve a clean spot on the chest for some writing. For example, their Oyobun's name. Many Yakuza members ask for their names to be edited out of their photos if they're taken. Others, like Watanabe here, get a new layer of tattoos on top of the old ones in order to conceal some of their past. Watanabe-san was very headstrong, even back in his school days. You know, as they say, one's character can be one's fate. He literally had to headbutt his way up to the top. Well, in the criminal world, yes, but quite successfully, nonetheless. My job was to force people to pay up. For example, clients who got three to five million yen worth of bills at the bar, or who borrowed money from the Yakuza, they could owe 10 or 20 million yen. I had to make them pay. It was one of our businesses. Do you recall any cases that somehow stand out in your memory when you had to collect a debt? Could you tell us? There were cases when I came only to find some other Yakuza waiting for me there. It happened a lot. People invite the Yakuza to back them up in negotiations and for protection or as a proxy. A case that stands out the most. Once I had to go to a traditional Japanese hotel to collect a debt. The landlady's son had accumulated a huge debt. 
who was involved in all kinds of shady schemes. The hotel's owner, his mother, was his guarantor. So I came there as a Yakuza and said, I need to talk to your son, he has a large debt. She was just a sick old lady, her hands were shaking, she had bad veins. I felt sorry for her once I saw her. The Yakuza Code of Ethics includes the Ninkyoro principle, that means noble behaviour. I took pity on her. I told her, I won't take anything from you now, I'm going to leave, but try to understand, next time another Yakuza will come. Do tell your son to take care of us as soon as possible. And I left without collecting anything. Sometimes I saw my opponent getting angry and feeling for a gun under his jacket. In such cases, I would let them know that I had a gun too. Such things happened. You know, he could have come to him putting his gun out on me and shooting. There were critical moments like this. We both represent our organisations, so we have to stand our ground, otherwise the word gets around that you're weak. But to be honest, there were also considerably less chivalrous moments in Watanabe's life. There was a time when I was an assassin for hire. I did all sorts of things. Is that why you went to prison? Not that time. I did for another thing. Some of my subordinates got time for homicide. Some got 15 years, others 20. Imagine, half of your life behind bars. I knew some who died in prison. There are many of those who did time, got out and got time again. So he actually happened to have killed people? You mean me personally? In a group, yes. You see, it's a matter of competition in the group. There's the top. And in order to get up, everyone is competing as who to take certain arrivals. That's what Yakuza do. They kill people. Did he ever kill anyone? Not personally now. I can tell you how many times I shot my gun and where the bullets went. And I can say, there were cases like when I broke into a flat to take out a rival Yakuza box, only to find an innocent old man there. The boss knew he was being hunted, ran away and left a patsy, an old guy. Maybe for insurance, I don't know. So I pulled a gun and the old man gasped. He was scared. I saw he was just an old man and left quickly. There were times when someone I knew got killed when I was around. I didn't watch them being killed, luckily, but I knew many who got killed this way or another. I saw many things. I recall chasing an enemy when fire came from behind our backs and one of our own tried to fire back at and uh, nearly killed me instead. Can you recall any shooting incident that somehow stood out in his entire Yakuza career? Something extraordinary? If there was anything like that? There was a time when I was part of a hit group and one assignment was to go to the Philippines not just to take out one guy but to track his activities too. He put surveillance on his office, on his apartment, on his lover's apartment and so on. If I was ordered to go and throw a grenade back in the day, I think I'd be happy to do it. In the Kansai group, they particularly valued people who were ready to take a bullet, risk their life. Such people were respected and they gradually moved up the career ladder. Now it's just part of the system, but back then I adored this kind of guys. I was ready to do time in prison, 15 years, 20 years, I don't, I don't care. An assassin, a killer. It sounded so impressive. But in reality we were just cannon fodder, expendables. I lost interest in this kind of life fairly soon and decided to take a break for a few months, six months maybe. I was so tired. You can't be cannon fodder all your life, right? So I returned home for some time and tried to help my father with his recycling business. I hadn't been close to my father until then, but when we talked, and for the first time, there was some understanding between us. So I decided to start a new life, went back home, and many knew that I used to be with the Yakuza, and started asking me to help them to collect a debt or do other things that Yakuza do. For instance, a real estate agent asked me to help him with buying some land. The investment frenzy was already wearing off at that time, so he hired me to put some pressure on the landowner and make him sign a deal. I mediated the deal and got so much money that I'd never get doing any other on his job. You can't even compare the two worlds. I would make 500,000 yen or even a million for mediating one deal. 
The other choice was to work my ass off doing some honest labour for much less. Naturally, I started to think of coming back to the old track. I reached out to my previous employing organisation, but it was already gone. The group was above us, joined another clan. The old boss was killed. His rival was about to get out of prison, and I and all the others in my gang wanted to kill him to score some major points. One day, one of our lower level gang operatives came to me and asked me for advice. I think he approached me because he couldn't pull it off himself. So, we went to the correctional facility that runs a social integration program for the inmates who had spent many years in prison. They had breaks between their classes. They were allowed to step outside during these breaks. When the gang leader went out, we kidnapped him, plainly speaking. We drove him to the mountains, I put a gun to his head and asked him what he wanted to do. Did he want to live an honest life? I said that I was ready to pull the trigger and get rid of the vehicle. And he cried. He said he repents the death of all those he commanded and he wants to become a monk and atone for his sins for the rest of his life. So we spared his life. We made him write a declaration saying that he disbanded his gang, took a photo of him, and I returned the Yakuza world with such serious score on my tab. At some point I started thinking, how is it even possible that such a super advanced nation as Japan still has such a powerful criminal underworld? Until recently, the Yakuza syndicates had real offices that looked no different than any other offices or banks or other businesses, with a logo, staff and receptionists. That's what made the Japanese Mafia different from any other. Today they don't operate openly anymore. So what are the origins of the Yakuza organizations? I thought, no shit, when I found out that Yakuza goes back to the times when, for example, the United States didn't even exist. It all started during the so-called Edo period in the history of Japan. That's between 1603 and 1868. It was the time when Japan was under the rule of Tokugawa shogunate, or dictatorship. That's right, there was once a dictatorship in Japan. The country we know today as democratic and progressive. Back then, Japan had an iron curtain of its own. It didn't trade with other nations and wasn't in contact with anyone. Social inequalities were increasing and members of the non-military class, who were mostly farmers, started to turn to the samurai for help in solving conflicts and disputes. There were those who employed the same services from the Yakuza, the Shadow Warriors. That's how the very first two Yakuza clans emerged. Initially, they were either disgraced vassals stripped of their assets and power, or ronin, samurai without a master, which is considered a disgrace. With time, they began to run gambling businesses in the cities, and made pretty good money. Known for their discipline, strict chain of command and loyalty, Yakuza became, with time, the first choice for people of high standing and considerable wealth as bodyguards and debt collectors. On top of that, the Yakuza kept their territory safe from any threats and violence. People even say here, the police protect citizens during the day and the Yakuza at night. A historical figure believed to be one of the first Yakuza bosses was Banzuin Chobai, a ronin and a Robin Hood figure. He was a labour broker who recruited workers to build the roads and opened a gambling den which both attracted workers and enabled him to make money from the bets they lost. Thus, one of the Yakuza lines of businesses they have been known for for centuries is supplying day labourers for any kind of jobs, and they do it even today. I had a gang of my own, I got married, and things were working out pretty well, like I struck it lucky finally. As for people relations, high school education was all I had, but since I was a Yakuza boss, I was on par with the kind of people like company directors or members of parliament, and I had no problem communicating with them and getting all sorts of business orders with them. I founded a company to keep the legal and shadow businesses apart. The hero of this century's biggest scandal involving a Yakuza boss was Taramasa Goto. He was a headstrong fellow, pretty much like our interviewee, Watanabe-san. Goto also managed to make his way to the top from an underling to an oyobun and became Tokyo's most influential crime boss. There were rumours that he once was the largest stockholder of the Japanese airline, which was the country's first and largest airline company, no less. The scandal broke out when it transpired that Goto had been an informant for the FBI the United States' top intelligence agency. He'd been giving up vital information about major crime figures, including his partner in crime. 
The most curious in this story is why he did it. In return, he was allowed to enter the US and have a life-saving liver transplant surgery in 2001. You probably recall me saying that those full bodysuit tattoos, the kind the Yakuza wear, on top of the alcohol abuse of course, can cause liver problems. And check out how Goto solved this, by turning into a CI. Seven years later, Tadamasa Goto became a Buddhist priest, just like Watanabe-san. Guys, if you like my video and if you like what we're doing, I would really appreciate if you support us on Patreon, on Pioneer or on PayPal. And we try to make even more great films from a new dangerous places for you. Thank you. All the links are in the description. Please donate. Once, I had some really weird experience. I was in a hotel room and some young dealer brought some drugs with him in those little plastic bags. Back then, syringes were sold over the counter, easy to get. I went to the restaurant, then to the bathroom and loaded the syringe with some water and injected myself with the drug, but felt no effect. However, when I returned to my room, my heartbeat was through the roof. I felt like my heart was going to fail. And I blacked out, like someone turned the lights off. And my consciousness left my body. I had a vision of seeing myself lying down on the floor. That's when I thought that now I know that one's consciousness can live outside the body. It was a very unusual experience. But I decided not to tell anyone. I was young and thought everyone would just say I had a trip. That time I got help. Someone called an ambulance. The hotel manager opened the door with a master key and I was taken to the hospital. It was a very powerful spiritual experience for me, but I decided not to act on it and move on. However, it kicked in when years later I got arrested on some petty charge. I was in my mid to late thirties. In detainment, I kept my mouth shut. The police couldn't make me talk. But by that time, everything in my life had was already been going wrong. I had family problems, problems with people and even with money. So at that time, I had no money, and by coincidence, the very next day was the payday when the Yakuza bosses have to pay their share to the top boss, and I was broke. And when the police came for me at that moment, I had a feeling that it was a sign that my time was over. And I let them arrest me. I didn't say anything and signed no papers. I didn't say a single word except maybe about the weather, then all of a sudden I felt a piercing pain right in the middle of my forehead, like a bullet hit me there. I was clueless about what it could be. Now I know that this is where the third eye is. And that was the signal for me that my life was about to change. Watanabe had plans to expand his gang's territory. In Tokyo, unlike in other regions, the spheres of influence are tightly distributed and thoroughly guarded. Each street is someone's turf. Both the police and the local gangsters knew that. When Watanabe showed up with his plan, it was easy for his rivals to set him up and let the police arrest him. I did my time. When I got out, my loyal guys were waiting for me. I looked at them and thought that I'd never lived an honest life and that being a Yakuza was the only choice I had. However, at the same time, I felt that deep inside, I've come to detest this way and I can't do it anymore. I told them I wanted to quit, but quitting Mafia isn't easy. I was expelled from my group. I tried to stay clean and make my living honestly, but my path always took me back to the underworld. I worked as a debt collector for some loan sharks. Basically, I did my old accuser job minus the title and the status. So it was bad. It was much worse. I'd seen many of my gang members die. Some overdosed, some died in prison doing time, some got shot. Lots of people died around me. I realized I had to do something about it, and in order to fill this sad void, I started to attend Buddhist temples. I was attracted to Homa, the ritual of consecrated fire. That's how I find my spiritual path. Today, Watanabe-san is leading Buddhist practices in his temple and even has a website where he writes about the healing methods he's offering. Anyone interested can sign up. As time went, it became unbearable. I was tormented by the contradictions inside me because I was still doing my old job on the one hand and yet I was drawn to the spiritual path on the other. So I approached Kojiki, a priest who was a famous healer. He could heal cancer and such things. And he looked at me and said, you've got the strength, give it a try. 
I was his 16th disciple. There were others who had started long before me, but yet couldn't get the approval of the priesthood. Well, I was granted it on my first request. I've been a priest ever since. My very first job was to perform a funeral service for a man who used to be in my gang. He died in prison. His family had disowned him, and he had no one. No one to arrange a funeral, no family at all. Only his girlfriend and her child from her previous relationship. But since he was in my gang, I was his family. And even though I'd only ever granted him priesthood, I wasn't allowed to perform the rites on my own, given the circumstances since he had no family. I asked for a permission to perform a funeral service for him, and I got the job. It was my first job as a priest. I wrote about it in my blog. I've seen all sorts of things, and thus I learned what forgiveness is. When I quit my life in the underworld, I found out I had no income. I'm not the kind of priest that gets lots of appointments. My reputation precedes me, not as a healer or a priest. At best, I have a couple of thousand yen in my pocket. There were days when I would spend hours riding a loop service metro line in Tokyo, just thinking, what am I doing? My dear people, in my next show, I will introduce you to some active Yakuza, not formal ones. These are the guys referred to as the new generation of the Japanese mafia. No more full body tattoos, no finger cutting, and a lot of their businesses are legit, yet they remain among the most daring criminal groups on the planet. This was Liadov. Subscribe to my channel.